Glory to God. Y'all been having a good time? Uh, before, I, before I get into the message, uh, we really do appreciate L.A. and Jamie blessing us with their presence in the America. I, I've been to Canada, and, and uh, they, they took me. I remember they had, the, what was that, what did you call that dish with the gravy on the French fry thing, whatever that is? Whatever that is. <laughs> And it, they, they would take us to these places where I got to try food in Canada that's not real common here, you know, and because they wanted us to experience their country. And now that they've been here, you've been here how long now? So it's, we're coming up on a year, and I heard a horror story. I heard that there's a delicacy, a rare, rare delicacy that we have in America that we prize very highly, that in almost a year... They have yet to experience. So I said, Angie, I want you to scour this town. I want you to go from, well, actually, she went across the street to Myers. But (laughs) I'd like to tell you that we have traveled far and wide in order to bring you this great delicacy. Here is your first can of beanie weenies. (laughs) Jamie, since, since L.A. is busy, uh, we'll, let, we'll let Jamie do the honors. Here is presented with love. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, the thing of it is, I really do like those things. <laughs> They're good. Beanie weenies are good. <laughs> That's a recipe from God, I think, you know. <laughs> Before I really get into the, I, I, I'm telling you, this conference is going to, you know, physically end tomorrow, but we're, I'm telling you, we're, we're on an assignment. This conference is going to continue, and church as you know it is about to come to an end. I'm telling you, we're, it's coming to an end. And we're, we're in a war, not really in church. And this is, I can't. I don't know if I can convey to you the excitement. I never felt so young. I never felt so energetic. I never felt like such a warrior. We're about to, we're about to enter into things that we have dreamed of forever. And we, we've been, you know, Dave would use the analogy. He says, you know, we start off having all these, we want these roof answers to roof questions. And he says, Lord, you don't even have any walls to support that roof. You don't have the foundation. So for Years and years we have meditated the word and we have prayed and, and fasted and done all of the things that we call the message. But by golly, it's been working. Line upon line, precept upon precept, another brick in the wall, another stone in the wall. They're coming up and I'm telling you, suddenly the roof questions, they're being answered. They're coming quick and you're going to see a change rapidly, rapidly. Amen. Amen. Um, and I've been to you, sir. <laughs> I've mentioned that I've been studying uh, some of the old timers more than even more than I have before. I've always I've always read after Smith Wigglesworth and and after uh, John G. Lake. I'm not sure there's much written that I haven't read, either that they wrote themselves or written about them. And today I was going back over some of uh, John G. Lake's materials again that he actually wrote himself, and I read it to my my daughter and son-in-law in, in the room right before we left. Now, I thank God for the technology. I do much the same. I have a, a talking Bible in my car on my phone. I, l- I listen to it a lot. I just I let it play. Uh, uh, Any of you that knows me knows I love the Word of God. I love to read it. I get lost in it. I don't know what's wrong with people. I don't know how they can, you know, it's, it's your call. I mean, Michael, he either worships or he dies. I either have God's Word or I die. I mean, I lose hours. Time just goes away, you know. I'll get in there and I'll be meditating back there in Joshua and the battles are going on. And I mean, before long, it's like a movie going. I can I can hear the clanging of swords on shields. I can, as they're fighting, the dust that gets kicked up, I can taste it in my mouth. I mean, four hours will go by. I, it'll become a living thing. And But I was reading after John G. Lake. And I love all the convenience we have. But these old timers, you know. You know what he said? He said, my brother, do you realize what we have? 
talking about the Bible. Do you realize what this is? He said, my brothers, you should read this on your knees. You should read this on your knees. Now, I know he didn't mean all the time or make a law out of that, but he was trying to get the point across. This is truth. These are the thoughts of God that did not originate on this planet. And somehow he has managed to get his mind in print form or on your tablet or however you have it where we can, we can literally study the very mind of Christ. I loved reading that. Talk about Smith Wigglesworth. Said he, would, he wouldn't pray maybe 30 minutes at a time. But he also wouldn't go more than 30 minutes without reading the Bible. And it didn't matter if he was in a restaurant or anywhere else. He'd just get it out. And he said, brethren, before we feed the physical man, we need to feed the spiritual man. Let's have a little food for our spirit. And he'd read a chapter or so out of Matthew. The Word of God. We've got to reverence the Word of God. Yes, sir. I'm going to give you a preview. I don't even know how this is going to happen yet. I just know this much of the mind of Christ for tomorrow night. Uh, for, hmm. <laughs> I told you I don't know much about it. On the one hand, he is absolutely restoring the word of God to us. We are learning, transforming the metamorphosis is taking place. I have a message at my website called Caterpillars Don't Fly. You know, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind? That word is the same word you'd use for a, the metamorphosis. When a caterpillar goes into that cocoon, it doesn't come out a caterpillar. See, this word of God literally changes who you are. It's a metamorphosis. It, it, it's a change that's supernatural. And you, it has, you have to allow the Spirit of God to work it through you. If you remain a caterpillar, no matter how educated you get, caterpillars can't fly. But uh, he didn't intend for us to stay an old caterpillar saved by grace. We're not, oh, you're going to see that. To, that's really tonight's lesson. You're going to see it in a way I've never, this is a new one. I've never taught it this way before. That's what's going to happen tonight. But now the other thing, this is a preview, and I don't know yet. I want to actually talk with Jim and Bronk a little bit, maybe get their wisdom, maybe L.A. too. Or maybe I just need to go pray in the Holy Ghost. But I do know what he's after, and it's, this we're going to talk about this tomorrow night. We have so many Christians. Thank, thank God that we've got to the place now where there are a lot of people who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues. Amen? Amen. Where I grew up, that was non-existent in the denomination. Thank God there is, we've got a lot of people now worldwide, not just in America, that, that have been baptized in the Holy Ghost and can speak with other tongues and pray the mysteries and all of the things that Dave has taught us. But this is the emphasis tomorrow night. He didn't really give you the Holy Ghost so you could speak in tongues. He said, you shall receive power. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. He gave you the Holy Ghost in order to be a witness for him in demonstration of the Spirit and in power. It's about time we're going to get a rebaptism of our baptism. Learn how to stir up the gift that we have on the inside of us. If you can come tomorrow night, I'd really come. I'm coming myself. I'm going to, I plan on coming to my service tomorrow night. I'm telling you right now. I, I know I can't, I, I don't know the details of it, but I know that's what he's after. Hmm. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, Lord. Okay. All right. Now this one tonight, I actually get to use some notes. I think. No, I think. <laughs> He hasn't stopped me yet. Stop me quick, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. With this uh, mindset of war. Now, I got I to, gotta, everything that I'm doing this week is based on a vision that he's given me recently. It's really nothing new. In fact, I'm going to, I'll share some, a little bit from a previous lesson 
called The Whole World Lieth in Darkness. It's already at my website. Uh, if I can find it here, I will. Yep, I didn't pull that one out. Here it is. Now, I'm telling you, there are so many scriptures tonight that we're going to look at. He's going to have us look at uh, the title of tonight's message is Our Union with Christ. Another way you could say it, Christ in you. Every truth is like a diamond. A diamond has many facets. That's one of the things we love about a diamond. It refracts light in many ways. It's beautiful to look at. You can take a pure diamond and it's got so many different facets, but it's all one diamond. This mystery of the gospel, Christ in you, Paul said it is the mystery of the ages that's been hid. But he said his job was to manifest and teach and deliver that mystery to the Gentiles. Hello, Gentiles. Amen. But I found that he did it looking through many different facets. He's trying. It's such a deep mystery. We understand it a little bit. But it's such a deep mystery. He would present it in many of his letters like looking at that same diamond through a different facet. And then he'd look at it a little different way. He's tr it's, it's too big. It's too strong to just in a few words demonstrate what it is. But if we don't ever get what it is, we're not going to be changed. We're not really going to be changed. Now, the reason it's so important, again, uh, <clears throat> the whole world lieth in the power of the wicked one. See, First John, again, you can, I recommend tonight you probably not turn to all these scriptures because when I get rolling here, we're going to go. <laughs> okay? Because what you would not, might like to have is some paper and pen to write down some sentences. And if not, the video and the MP3 will be available. You can do it later if you just want to enjoy. We're going to get into a little uh, demonstration here in a little bit. I think that'll be very helpful. But see, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now, that's the way it's worded in the King James. But I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can read Greek scholars' books. <laughs> That where it says wickedness, the whole world lieth in wickedness. In the Greek, that is in the masculine, indicating a person, not a condition. Wickedness is a condition. But it's in the masculine, indicating a person. It's not just wickedness. It is the source of wickedness. The whole world, what it really says, the whole world lieth under the power of the wicked one. Did you know that Satan, after the resurrection, after the resurrection in Corinthians, Paul said, he is the God of this world. Little g. I thought this week I was going to get more into the warfare scriptures uh, and talking about uh, the time in between and other things, but apparently that's for another. Stay tuned. We have a website. <laughs> Stay tuned. Those things will be coming. See, 1 John 5.20 says this, We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son Jesus. This is the true God in eternal life. Now notice, we are in Him that is true. We are in Him that is true, not just in Him. Excuse me, not just in truth. We are in him. See, it's that same masculine. If that masculine wasn't there, we could say we are in truth. But it's, it's translated correctly in the next verse. The same construction, masculine, meaning we are in him that is true. We are in Christ, amen? Believers are in Christ and, the king, and in the kingdom of God while on earth. But unbelievers are in the kingdom of darkness. And are under the power of him who is wicked. Did you get that? Now, let me read just a little bit. And then we're going to get into tonight's lesson. You've got to understand we are two kingdoms at war. There's the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of light. Some of the verses we may get to tonight. It says, he has delivered us. Us. Believers. Out of the kingdom of darkness. Amen. We've been delivered out of the power. 
The word there is authority. We've been delivered out of the authority of darkness. But that's only us, the believers. And most believers don't know it. Most believers don't know that they've been delivered out of that authority. But the whole world is still lying under the power of the wicked one. And what I saw in that vision that time, I saw recently, I saw the whole world and it was like covered with this dark fog. I don't know how else to put it. You could see through it, but boy, it was dark. And it was like Satan's the god of this world and the whole world lieth under the power of the wicked one. And suddenly there was this light and that was Jesus when he was conceived in the womb of Mary. In him was life and that, that's the light of the world and, and God is light. And so there's this one. He grows up to be a man. He gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. Then you've got this one light moving through that dark fog. Now the dark fog is still there. The whole world lieth under the power of darkness. And here's this one light anointed by the Holy Ghost. Boy, if you could zoom in and watch everywhere he goes to him, when he came to that woman that had been bowed over for 18 years, to him, that's a prisoner of war. This source, this wicked, wickedness, this evil one. Where is that verse, Lord? I've got so many things in me, I'm trying to focus on what he wants. I did a, le a lesson recently. When it says, there's a verse where it says, he went about and healed all of their plagues. P-L-A-G-U-E-S. I don't know why the Lord had me look up that word plagues. When I looked it up, I was shocked. The literal word for plagues, and it was just talking about people. He was healing all these people. Healed of their plagues. When I looked it up, it is the Greek word for the Roman scourging. From God's point of view, Every time you find somebody sick, bowed over, arthritis, cancer, I don't care what it is. From God's point of view, they're being scourged by the devil. They've been taken prisoner of war by this God of this world, and they are being scourged. Think about the woman that was bowed together for 18 years. Now, Jesus specifically said about that that woman, whom Satan hath bound. Eighteen years. And Jesus walks in, and it just says when he saw her. It doesn't say he prayed to God about it. It doesn't say anything. When all he had to do was see her. It's like in World War II when they came on those extermination camps. And the prisoners are behind the wire. All they had to do was come on that camp. And what happened? They opened the gates and let the captives go. Jesus did exactly the same thing. Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Glory to God. Straightened her right up. Now, what this gospel is about, God wants more than one light. Now, even when he put his mantle on the twelve, there was still just one light. They weren't born again. They weren't light. Not yet. Now, he prophesied about them that they would be light. When he put it on the 70, his mantle on the 70, they were functioning under his mantle. But there was still only one light. That's why he had to go through his death, burial, and resurrection. So that he could become the firstborn from the dead. If there's a firstborn, he, he suddenly hears that light again. But if there's a firstborn, that means there's a secondborn. That means there's a thirdborn. And your number's in there somewhere. Now when God looks down. Now this world, if whether you know it or not, I didn't have, we're not going to get there this week. This whole world still lies under the power of darkness. You do understand John wrote that verse near the end of his life. First John was written near the end of John's life. And he's still saying the whole world lieth under the power of the wicked one. But bless God, we're not under that power. We are the light of the world. We are the lights anointed by the Holy Ghost to go and set the captives free. Now that's what the church, that's what we're coming into quickly. Quickly. I don't, this is not going to take 20 years. I expect Homer to be seen before Christmas. I want the toe back also. Diabetes. Whatever name you, I don't care what name it is. The name of Jesus is above every name that's named. I called Homer the other day. I said, Homer, I expect you to be seen before Christmas. He said, when that happens, I'm going to buy you all the Krispy Kremes you can eat. Amen. 
my man Homer. We're all contending. I know we all got our faith out there, but I'm telling you, we're going to see some manifestations. The devil's in trouble. He just don't know it yet. Or maybe he does know it, but anyway. Let me just read a little bit, and then I'll get into the. I haven't even started tonight's lesson. We've got a, two kingdoms at war. We must come to the place where we see the truth of this world. It is absolutely two kingdoms at war. Religion has taught Christians, and when I say religion, I mean fruitless religion, powerless religion, has taught Christians that God uses sickness for some secret purpose of his that we can never understand. That's why you put that faith-killing phrase, heal them, Lord, if it be thy will. The truth is that God wants us healthy, free from sin, anointed for dominion, shining as lights in this dark world to set the captives free. But we're never going to understand that unless we come to a worldview that agrees with God's worldview, and it is two kingdoms at war. We must know our enemy and enforce the victory over him that Jesus Christ has won. You will never resist what you believe to be the will of God. If there is a tiny shred within you that still believes sickness and disease might be the will of God for you or for others, you'll not endure like a soldier does in battle. Hey, a soldier in battle, it's life or death. You can't be wishy-washy and should I shoot him or not? Shoot him! Shoot him! Run that devil off. It's, it's, the, it's darkness every time. Run him off. He said to me the other day for, now here, okay, this previews, not tonight's lesson. I hope I get to do tonight's lesson. <laughs> I said, I'm looking for, anyway. He said to me, he says, I'm driving along, minded my own business on the way to church. And he said to me, for a Christian to not believe that his words will come to pass is like a soldier on the battlefield believing his bullets will not fire. Did you hear that? For a Christian to believe that his words will not come to pass is the same as a soldier on the battlefield believing that his bullets will not fire. If your bullets won't fire, you're in trouble. You're going to grow us up. A soldier understands he is in a war. To stop for a soldier means certain death for himself and for others. There is no stopping until the enemy is defeated. This is life or death, win or lose, all or nothing. There is no truce. There is light, darkness, life, and death. It is two kingdoms at war. That's the introduction to another lesson. This is tonight's lesson. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Now, again, you don't have to turn to all of these. There's going to be quite a few scriptures. And we're going to have some visual demonstration. Jesus used that all the time. He used parables and natural things to help, help understand. Visuals help, don't they? By the way, L.A., that was one of the best things this morning I ever heard in my life. The gift of a teacher is to take complicated, difficult things and bring it down to communicate it in a way that everybody can understand it. That was a masterful job. That, that was good, really good. <clears throat> okay, now we're starting. That's my introduction. We're starting now. <laughs> the mystery of the ages is Christ in us, our hope of glory. Paul made mention of that mystery when he wrote in Colossians 1, verses 26 and 27. He's talking about even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Don't we love that verse? And we sing about that verse. And I, I love that verse. I, I've thought about that verse. But unless that changes our results, we're not much better off than if we never heard of it. But that's the mystery. That is the secret. That is the whole point of him going through if, if it wasn't for him to manifest that truth, Jesus didn't have to die. He could have just stayed one light, couldn't he? It could just be one. He could just, just be him. But no, God needs multitudes of lights. He needs many lights. So he's made this way for Christ to be in you, the hope of glory. So we're going to study that a little bit now. 
that it is absolute truth, but it's a difficult mystery for the mind to comprehend. Paul wrote about this truth often, this union between Christ and the believer. In the letter to the Galatians, he wrote it this way, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. By the way, what's, is, is, a, is a cross intended to hurt you? Oh, there's only one purpose of a crucifixion, right? That's death. So when Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, I'm dead. Well, nevertheless, I live. Now, wait a minute. Paul, are you dead? What do you mean? You're, you're crucified. You're dead. Nevertheless, I live. He's trying to convey this mystery. Well, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. But now notice, Christ liveth in me. There's still a Christ and a me, but I'm dead, but I'm not dead. Well, I, I live, but it's not me. <laughs> oh, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm writing after this one. I'm going, all right, Paul, I'm dead. Crucifixion does not wound you, it kills you. Yet you're telling me I live. Yet it's really not just I anymore. But Christ liveth in, quote, me. Notice, Christ and me still coexist. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, by the way, if your Bible says faith in the Son of God, I'm not telling you to throw it away. But I'm because I'm just because I'm being nice. <laughs> but you need to scratch through that because um, there's a vast difference. It does, it does not mean I live by the faith in the Son of God. You're living by His very own faith. It, the, the, love, the power of that verse, if you leave, don't leave it as faith in the Son of God. Don't leave, don't mark through it. I live by the faith of the Son of God. If you learn how to tap into His faith, you reckon your prayer life is going to change? You reckon your ministry is going to change? You're going to see it here in a little bit. It's real. And there's just no doubt. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, Faith, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Okay. Christ in us. Let's think about that. Christ in us. His very life within us is what generates that spirit of life that makes us free from the law of sin and death. You remember Romans 8 too? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, John G. Lake, I have this testimony at my website in a PDF. I just, I, it's free on the website. And you can just, if you want to just Google it, it's just John G. Lake Bubonic Plague, and it'll come up for you, okay? But we, we've got it at our website. If you have not heard that story, while during his time in Africa, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague, and they were burying people. I mean, it was an epidemic. They were burying them by the thousands and the trouble of it is, even the people that would try and go bury them or, or care for them, they would catch the plague and they would die. Except John G. Lake and his helper. And they could minister to them and, and, and help them wipe their brow, keep them cool. But they would also bury them. And people expected them to get the plague because everybody else did. But they never did get it. And finally, these doctor researcher guys come and they go, what is this? Have you found some secret cure? He said, yes, I have. Yes, I have found a secret cure. They said, well, what is it? And he said, he just quoted that verse. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And they said, well, what are you talking about? So they went and got some froth from their mouth. And when they die, this bloody froth would come up out of their lungs. They went and got some froth and they put it on, on, on uh, they, they looked at it first under a microscope and it was just teeming with that bubonic plague, bacteria, germs, whatever it is. It was just teeming with it. They took a little drop of it, put it on his, on John G. Lake's skin, and the instant that it touched his skin, they looked under, under the microscope again, every, everything was dead. It completely killed him. He said, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. 
Now, I've thought about that with Jesus himself growing up. You know, he didn't do any miracles until he himself was baptized in the Holy Ghost. But bless God, he had that law of the spirit of life on the inside of him from the time he was conceived. And I thought, you know, we never read about him ever being sick. I bet the devil tried to make him sick. Don't you reckon if, a, if any kind of plague or any kind of thing came through town, you know, swine flu or whatever they had back then, I don't think he ever got sick. Why? He already had the law of the spirit of life on the inside of him. Now, here's the amazing thing. You've got it on the inside of you. We've got it on the inside of us. We're going somewhere now. Okay. He didn't have some different law of spirit of life that I, than what you had. This has got to do everything with that oozing. Candy had a revelation of this quite a few years ago. She was having terrible, terrible back problems. And, and there wasn't really a whole lot they, they, you know, promising that they were offering to do for her. So she got a revelation of this. And she says, well, I know my spirit woman does not have back problems. I'm, I hope I'm getting it close. I call on my spirit. I, I want that life to ooze out of my spirit woman into my natural back. Wasn't very long. She's running the 5K with Bronk. Got healed totally of that back problem. Amen? Well, that same life that heals back problems can heal the swine flu. In fact, it'll keep it from getting you. All right. That's not really our lesson tonight. Now, remember, though, now you have that in you, but the whole world lies under the power of the wicked one. Let me read that verse to you, 1 John five nineteen, out of the Amplified. It says, we know positively that we are of God, and the whole world around us, is under the power of the evil one. When it says power there, the, it says the law of the spirit of life within us is what has delivered us, not the world, from the authority of darkness. And we have literally been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Now let's look at this Christ in you again. Look at it in Colossians chapter 1. Wait, you don't have to turn there, but it's Colossians 1 verse 12. Now, he's really describing it again. But he says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is what Jesus meant when he prophesied that not only was he the light of the world, but he knew one day his disciples, they would be born again, and we would become the light of the world. Do you know he said that about you? You are the light of the world. Now, here it is. Let me, let me quote it here. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. He says, you are the light of the world, prophesying about that day when they'd be born again. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Now, this is the verse. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Oh. The good works he's referring to there? I'll tell you what they're not. We know for sure from Scripture those good works are not giving Praying or fasting. Because he told us all of those things were to do it in secret. Not to be seen of men. But we're going, well, uh, you know, that's stuff we can all do. We can pray. We can give. And we can fast. But he wants our works to shine before men. And not to be done in a, in a secret place. Do it publicly. And they'll glorify God. Gee, I wonder what kind of works he might be talking about. John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, this is the head of the church. He is saying to us, to the church, not just the fivefold. If you're a believer, he's talking to you. I expect you to do works, the same works that I did. 
I expect you to do it publicly where everybody will know and give glory to the Father in heaven who empowered you to do the works. Now, this is the head of the church. This is, this is not really a suggestion. Yet it's largely ignored because, well, we can't do that. Excuse me. Duh. <laughs> no, you can't. Not unless you understand Christ in you. Okay, we're going to go a little more. But is that good or what? He said, I, not, he, no, I don't want you to let men watch you pray. And I don't want you to watch, you know, let them see you giving or fasting. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the supernatural works. The same works that you saw me do. And I want you to do it publicly where they'll know for sure. And I want you to tell them, my father in heaven, it's the father in me. He doeth the works. Okay. See, we struggle with that. We think about that. We don't want to say, uh, we don't want to say, uh, Lord, we're just not going to do that. <laughs> but we struggle with it, mainly because we're so familiar with our own faults and our own family, uh, failings, or sometimes families. <laughs> you know, my mama would love me if I, was the best, if I was the best bank robber in Oklahoma. She'd say, he's sure good at what he does. But anyway, <laughs> that's the way mamas are, right? Anyway. But we do struggle with that because we are so familiar with our own faults and our shortcomings. And sometimes even, yes, even sin itself. We don't deny these scriptures, but there's just enough residual unbelief residing on the inside of us that it hinders the work of God flowing through us. So let's delve a little deeper into this mystery of Christ in us, our hope of glory. Another time when Paul wrote of this mystery was to the Ephesians. Now, this time he compared this union, Christ in you. There's a union, Christ in you, you and Christ in the same vessel, Christ in you. He spoke of this union when he spoke of the union. He compared it to the union of a man and a woman in marriage. Now, this one's Ephesians 5. This is another facet. Verses 28 through 32. It says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord, the church. Now get this part. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined. Get that word. Remember that word joined. It's going to be important in a little while. For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now there where it says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. Say it with me. My bones are his bones. My flesh is his flesh. Christ and I share this body. Jesus said concerning the marriage union. No, no, that's, we're done. <laughs> you guys are so obedient. I love it. I'll tell you what. Say, Gary is handsome. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some money later anyway. <laughs> Jesus said concerning the marriage union. Now, he's talking about marriage, is he not? He's, he says, I'm really talking about Christ in the church. I'm using a marriage as, as an analogy to help you understand. Well, when Jesus was teaching about marriage, he said this in Matthew 19, 6. Wherefore, they are no more twain, two, but one flesh. Now, get this. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, let me ask you a question. I mean, Paul's not using this analogy by accident. Are married people only married during certain times of the day? Are they joined in the marriage union at breakfast, but not at noon? Are they married during the day, but not at night? Well, some people think that's the case. <laughs> 
Because, you know, they cheat and do things. They act like they're not married. But the truth of it is, God's plan for marriage, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And by the way, that union is 24 hours a day for life. For life. Amen. All right. Now, Paul wrote again of the mystery of our union with Christ in Colossians. Now, this one's a little tougher. Colossians 3.3. 3. He's still talking about this union and trying to get us to understand it. He says for Colossians 3.3. 3, for you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Well, now we're going to do a little visual demonstration starting now. Now again, you young ministers that are coming up, I'll just give you some wisdom ahead of time. Whenever you are ministering in another man's church, you always make the pastor Jesus. You got that? Don't ever make him the devil. Make him Jesus. Pastor Jim, would you come on up here? All right. Now, Pastor Jim, of course, is going to represent Christ. We're going to stay right in the middle so the camera can, can get us here pretty good. The blue line is good. Stay on that. I haven't given him any coaching at all. He doesn't know what in the world I'm about to do here. Trust me. Now, Pastor J Jim represents Christ. I represent me. Okay. We, if you can pick, I wish I had a big cardboard box that was open in the front representing a body. We... Christ in me, we, if you can picture, somehow we together are in this body. Can you picture that? All right. We share together this body. Now, at first in the vision, now this represents, right in the center. At first in this vision, this represents typical Christianity. I am Gary Carpenter. I got born again. Christ is in me. But <clears throat> I'm pretty well in charge of my life. And when you meet me, I'm going to talk about my stuff, and I'm going to talk about my plans, and, and uh, my personality, and I like to do this, and I like to do that. Now, I'm going to heaven. I got Christ in me, you know. But for most, and it's, and, you know, that's, that's, that's at least God's goodwill. He's trying to get people to heaven, all right? But that's typical Christianity. You see me, you know me, and you, you almost have to take my word for it that Christ is in me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and that I'm going to I wrote here. This this represents what you're seeing right now. This represents typical Christianity, where we're standing in front. We're the most visible, but Christ in us has not been yielded to very much. We have Him. It's almost like fire insurance, <laughs> but we're still very much in charge of our own life, make our own decisions. We, pretty, in in that case, you pretty much see me more than you see Christ in me. Good enough? But see, the truth that we just read there, he says, no, Gary, you, Gary, the me part, you are dead. I don't like that. <laughs> you are dead. And the truth of it is, as far as God's concerned, my life is hid in Christ. Now, we're both in this body. We're still in, hello, we're, <laughs> we're, still, we're, <laughs> we're still in here. But see, it's supposed to, I must decrease. He must increase. And what you should see more is Christ in me than you really see Gary. My life is hid in Christ. Is that making sense to you? Okay. <laughs> All right, now hang on. Now, by the way, Paul himself said he was, he never felt like he fully attained to this. Even at near, you know, later in life, he says, listen, I don't count myself to have attained. But I am pressing toward that mark. We're all pressing toward that mark. So don't be so hard on yourself. Even the Apostle Paul. But this is the goal where the world sees Christ and not Gary. All right. Now, watch this. I said earlier that what God had joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, I've got to be honest with you, we put it asunder all the time. This union, <laughs> I'm supposed to be hid back here, right? We're supposed to be going out and doing shining light works. And all is well at first because I'm dead and hidden in Christ. But all of a sudden, Christ in me says, 
There's a sick person right over there. Let's go set the captive free. This is how I we make us tear asunder what God joined together. Because right there I'll go, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. <laughs> now watch, what's supposed to happen? Dead man, get back where you belong. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's, so he says, Christ in me again says, let's go, let's go set that captive free. Let's go heal that person. <laughs> I can't heal the sick. Boy, no amens hardly. Did you hear that? There'll be more amens by the time we get through. Because when you start saying that, were you dependent on you in the first place? Isn't it Christ in you? Stop it. You're holding him back. Get back. Dead man, get back where you belong. Okay. Another example. You start saying... Only Christ can heal the sick. And what that really translates to, I ain't laying my hands on nobody. <laughs> and all my religious excuses, why? I'm just me. I'm not ready. I need to pray more. I need to fast more. He doesn't. He doesn't. We're all the time putting asunder what God has joined together. What are, you, what are you doing always poking your head out back there? You know? Our life, we are dead. And our life is hid in Christ. When, the, when we start coming up to the devil's territory, I'll be honest with you, I don't want him seeing me at all. <laughs> get him, get him, Christ. Get him, get him. <laughs> That's all I want them to see. I don't need to be. I don't need to be poking my head out back here, and I, I'll stay hid in Christ. Amen. <laughs> this is what I saw. <laughs> see, but even this analogy is not perfect, because it gives the impression that we are two separate spirits sharing a single body. Now, this one you can look it up later. This one's in your Bible. See, Paul also wrote. He's still writing. Still trying to get it across to us. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Amplified, it's even stronger, it says, But the person who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. This truly is a great mystery. I'm trying, I was trying to, how do I picture this? How do, you know, it's one thing for both of us to be inside a body, but now he's talking about combining us somehow. And I'm going, I'm going, get ready. I'm going, well, if that was possible, well, somehow God could literally join me together with Christ himself. Gee, that would have to be like, that'd be like a new creature. <laughs> Come here, Bronk. Come here, Bronk. Go ascend up to your throne, sir. Ascend up to your throne. There you go. All of a sudden, now, this guy, he would be like Superman. <laughs> now, I don't know how to picture this. This is the Spirit of Christ joined with, with the soul of Gary Carpenter. I have my memories. I have my thoughts. I have my same education. But I'm not Gary anymore. I'm really not Gary. There is a new creature here. And he's like, look at him. Superman. <laughs> this, this is life and light. See, John 1, 4 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. This is a new creature. This is something that didn't exist before. This is the joining together, two becoming one. 
Christ in us, our hope of glory. Now, what does the Bible say about this guy? There's a few things that the Bible says. This man here, which is Gary, but it's not Gary. But Gary lives, but Gary's dead. <laughs> okay, I don't know how better to picture it. I, okay, do you know this man here is created in righteousness and true holiness? Do you know this man here? He's called a king. Pardon me while I place a crown. This man is born a king. Didn't, he wasn't made a king. He was born a king. I would have put a, a scepter in your no, the right hand. But a scepter, he's got a staff here, a golden staff. Because he's also, the Bible says he is a Lord. He is a king. Jesus. Now the reason we have Jim up here. See, Jesus himself has his own spirit. Jesus himself, the glorified God-man Jesus himself is in heaven. That's why I asked Jim to go up just to be exalted. I'd go even higher if I could. <laughs> Stand on something. No, that's right. <laughs> Jesus himself is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. Yet, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. I see our mind, your brain starts leaking out your left ear right there. But it's, it's the truth anyway. And you're not the same old person that the devil keeps telling you that you are. Amen. What does it say about this guy? It says, this guy here is a king. He's a Lord. He is more than a conqueror. It says about this man, he is God's son. It says he is Satan's master. And he is man's servant. This man here is not of this world. He's in it, but he's not of it. This man, the real man, did you know he loves righteousness? He hates iniquity. This man fearlessly, completely trusts God. This man what he says comes to pass. This man, he believes that when he speaks, his bullets will fire. <laughs> Got that? I'll tell you something else about this man, though. He never forgets who his Lord is. He lays down, when he approaches his real master, he lays down that scepter. He takes the crown off his head, casts it at Jesus' feet. And together we bow before the Lord. We worship, we know, we are soldiers in the army. And our Lord Jesus is the captain of the army. He is Lord, we are not. We don't ever start getting puffed up or thinking something. Everything we are is because of him who died for us. Amen? Amen. Now that keeps you in the place of servitude. And keeps you in the place of humility, see? You might ask, you look at this more than a conqueror, this king, this Lord, this man who stomps on sin, this man reigns as a king in this life. And you say, but whatever happened to Gary Carpenter? He died. He was crucified. Yet the truth of it is, he lives. But it's not really Gary. It's Christ lives in me. This body that I have, I've got a conqueror in there. Me and this conqueror are one in a way that is almost impossible to describe. No wonder we're to rule and reign and never, ever lose. Now, tonight we're not going to get into the baptism of the Holy Ghost. See what this man here has? He's a power, the power over sin power to walk a righteous and a holy life, he's also able to hear from God. But Jesus himself didn't do those works until he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now, if Barry was here tonight, I'd have Barry come because he's the only person here bigger than Bronk. <laughs> but see, what happens is you get baptized. This man, he gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. And Bronx, and Barry's not been here big enough. How, how, do, you, how do you visualize? Do you understand God, the Holy Ghost, God, God, the Holy Ghost. If you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, do you understand God dwells in you? 
And you think sickness is a problem? You think cancer is going to win? We win. Did you get anything out of that? <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Pra praise God. It, it, is a, it is a great mystery. But we've got to go from intellectual knowledge to walking in the truth of this. It's about time we just laugh at sin. See, the church, we're still struggling with sin and what God's interested in. We're supposed to be out setting the captives free. We're supposed to be out doing the works and doing it publicly. Now, I will tell you this, the word for witness, when he says, when he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and then you'll be my witnesses, that word witness is martyr. In the Greek, it's martyr. See, you'd think everybody would be glad. Yeah, the, uh, they crucified him. And they're going to be not <laughs> They're going to come after you too. But even then, we reign as kings. We are more than conquerors. He said, I want you to go and publicly do the works. Let your light shine that men may see those good works and glorify our Father which art in heaven. Hallelujah.